Hey guys, how are you? I'm Revolution Land. Um, welcoming my buddy Michael Friedman, who is uh, got actually two incredible hats over at AP. So he is the director of Heritage as well. So he oversees everything. No, no, just the historian. Mr. Vivas is the director of Heritage. Okay. I support I support Mr. Vivas's team as the historian. Yeah, but, but with a little bit here and there. And then and then he's also uh, heads up the complication uh, complicated watches as well, right? And that's that must be super fun as well, right? So how do you how do you balance those two gigs, dude? The complication gig is kind of the main one these days. What what connects the two roles of having worked in the heritage team for so many years and transitioning a year and a half ago over to running complications is really the relationships with the clients and uh, with our collectors around the world. This is an interesting reality in 2020 that wasn't the case 20 years ago. Um, in that sense that the vintage collector and the modern collector are very much eclipsed. This used to be very much two different worlds. The individuals who collected vintage collected vintage and didn't really care that much for contemporary production. Of course, there were exceptions and modern buyers didn't really understand the vintage thing. Now we're in an era where most collectors at a minimum and enthusiasts will have respect and many will actually have watches in their collection that represent both the past and the present. Um, that's extremely commonplace now. So this is where sort of the logic starts to come in where you can have a, a role that is linking what we've done in the past and helping be part of the team of what we're creating in the future because this is precisely how people are acquiring watches themselves, thinking about watches. Of course, when you're creating any product in any field, ways you know better than anyone the goal in any product of culture is to try to cut through the timeline to try to make something that can outlive a moment and outlive a trend hopefully that's the that's what when something becomes a classic or an icon in music or in film or in design or in any field um, so that's where the historical perspective can bring a little bit of input into what we're working on for tomorrow so michael freeman um, let's talk about perpetual calendars. Um, it's done, it. uh, and incidentally, congratulations on the amazing book on uh, complicated uh, Audemars Piguet. It's such a great reference for people to have. Um, we're, we're going to also um, be kind of uh, communicating about the book for the next couple of days, and I think at the end of the week, we're mm -hmm. actually going to even offer it for sale to, to all the readers as well, because if you love complicated watches and you love AP, this is absolutely what well, you need to have. It was funny because uh, I was just talking to Fonso Benamias, uh, and he was saying at one point they were wondering, should we reveal like all the numbers, all the different models that we created over the years? And finally, I think they decided to go ahead. I think by that point, they'd also bought all of them. So, <laughs> so, so you're looking at the beautiful collection of the AP Museum. And I think Mr. Bottinelli has a few of these as well. But it, it's so cool to be able to look at the entire history of AP's watches. Michael, is Don I made that AP to me has one of the most incredible histories with the perpetual calendar um, uh, in wristwatch format. And I just kind of want to go through that a little bit as well. So the first watch I'm going to pull up, the 5503 full calendar. So this is a watch from 1942, um, kind of beautiful, I guess I, the Italians would call it fagiolini shaped lugs. Like, um, but it's a complete calendar. So in 19, just uh, like, so as in context, in 1941, um, Paddock has by this point put out the 1526, uh, which is the first serially produced perpetual calendar. And um, AP is making this watch, which is incidentally beautiful, stunning dial, really like the iconography of, uh, of AP's uh, language for its calendar complications, but at this point, not yet a perpetual calendar. Um, what, tell us a little bit about this watch uh, and where AP was right at the time in terms of these type of complications. Absolutely. So it's a, it's a really interesting question. And at this point in history, you're absolutely right. Patek Philippe had introduced reference 1526, um, the first perpetual calendar wristwatch, beautiful model. It was ultimately made, if I remember correctly, in 210 examples before the watch was discontinued. But meanwhile, over at Audemars Piguet, right nearby, right in the same valley, um, watches were not yet being made in series. There were no reference numbers yet. Reference numbers don't arrive at Audemars Piguet until 1951, which means all of the watches before 1951 um, are essentially unique watches. There's no two that are identical. Wow. They were all categorized by a term that we call internally, we call it pre-models, or we call them photo numbers, because the watchmakers meticulously, when they would finish a watch, they would take a photograph of the watch. We have all of those original photographs 
Um, and that's what the content, much of the content of the book includes. So these were unique watches that were being created. So even when you had one, like in this case form, which the case form would have had a number associated with it, each of them would have been different one to the next. There would have been slight, difference, slight differences with the dial fonts, with the details, um, with the tone of the dial. Some would be all gold, some would be steel and gold, all these different types of changes. So this particular model over here uh, is extremely, extremely rare. There were only 20 examples total of full calendar chronograph that were produced in the vintage era. Um, so that's an incredibly small number. And again, no two are identical. There were never any perpetual calendar chronographs made by Audemars Piguet in the vintage era. We never introduced, we did not do that complication until much later in our history. Right. It wasn't for us until 1955, which is, you're probably going to pull that one up shortly, where yeah. we introduced our first perpetual calendar. So at this time, we're producing full calendar uh, yeah. watches, minute repeaters, chronographs, and then a few of those full calendar chronos. Okay. So what I need your help a little bit on the next reference. So, uh, and I love the fact that all this information is out there. Uh, the 5516. Um, now, I'm told before we get into the images of it, there's 12 watches. Uh, three watches with the that that have no leap year indicator, and were those launched then in 1950? Is that correct? Yeah. So it launched is even a strange word. These because in the sense these were individual watches that were being created, and they it's not as if they were finalizing the design in the way that we do today. At this point, these are more like unique creations of art in, in many senses in that in that regard. You're not creating or introducing a product line like you would through the lens of today. These are individual creations, which were also very expensive for their time period. And here you can get a good example of how within the reference of 5516, you have so much variation right out of the gates in that sense. So you had a couple that did not have a leap year on the dial. And those watches are part of the family because they had that same indication in the archives. However, the nine with the leap year are the ones that we consider the more official versions of the reference 5516. So you had three preliminary without leap year, nine with leap year. Of the nine with leap year, the first three had the moon phase up at 12 o'clock, and then the following six had the moon phase down at six o'clock. And there's also an evolution with all of the dial details. Um, I was very interested in what you were saying, both related to the 5503 and to these, and that they were, there was remarkable variation from, from piece to piece. Even just these two watches, it, the, the variation is remarkable. You have the one on the right-hand side that's got the date indication fixed to the canon pinion and at the perimeter of the dial, and then on, on the other watch, you've got it uh, fixed at, at 3 o'clock. Uh, you've got, you know, I mean, it's quite a significant difference in configuration. Were these watches all made on, off of the same Ebosh? Absolutely, and it's also the same Ebosh of the Patek Philippe's we were just referring to. This was the, the, the very the famous Valjoux 13 line caliber, um, the most important caliber in mid-century watchmaking, hands down. Audemars Piguet and Patek Philippe don't have these watches without that critical caliber. Think of these more as movement blanks than Eboshes. These, it's, it's, it's in the sense that these weren't finished movements that then were just decorated um, and fitted. These were essentially what Valjoux was providing at this time and Le Colt, um, and Le Magne for brands like Audemars Piguet and Patek Philippe were more often movement blanks, which were very rudimentary. You had the plates, you had the primary gears, but then all of the complications were then produced in-house at the different uh, watchmakers, respectively, Audemars Piguet or Patek. Um, the complications were all done either, and then the dial work, all of this was done either in-house or from the local network of suppliers. At that point in history, Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe, Vacheron Constantine, the big makers would often utilize suppliers from the Valley des Joux. Most famously, of course, is the Graves watch. Uh, that's probably the most famous watch that utilized really all of the principal knowledge that was there, all of the best know-how, all of the best living watchmakers in the moment in the Valley who weren't necessarily assigned to one brand full-time. They were independent, 
would be projects with different brands. So for example, the under dial work on the 5516 was done by a supplier named Albert, who was just phenomenal and just was a specialist in the Valley at under dial work, did extensive amounts of work with Audemars Piguet on these high complications and was just a master of his work in that sense. And so this is where you start to see that notion of artisanship. Um, and in these watches, there really are unique creations. It's not just with the 208 moon phase watches, it's also the 307 vintage chronographs and or the 35 minute repeaters. All 550 of those complications that are in the or referred to in the book, we haven't seen all of them, of course, but that's the total number of AP complication wristwatches from 1892 up until the rebirth of complications. It's 550 watches total. And in all of them, you see these characteristics. You see this play of light. You see the satin and mirror finishings on the cases. You see uniquely expressed dials. You see the work of human beings in those watches and the individuality. And what's most interesting is you see it reflected in the archives. That's where it gets extremely interesting. And the humanity of the watchmaking gets inserted right into the dialogue. That's the portal back to the past, is when you have the watch and you have the archive and you see the little drawings, the illustrations, the notes, sometimes notes of frustration from the watchmaker. Sometimes th those archives can even become a journal of sorts of what the watchmakers were experiencing and what they were going through. All right. So in 1955 is the very first actually the world's first perpetual calendar with a leap year indication. In this case, as you were mentioning, at six o'clock in a 48 month format. Um, so tell us a little bit about this. So this is, is the world's first um, perpetual calendar wristwatch with a leap year indication, of course. That's uh, correct. So, so the ones you had up earlier were, the, were pre-models because those were before 1951. Those were sort of, let's, they, they were experimental watches. Um, interestingly, Patek Philippe was the buyer of one of those early watches. If you, it's indicated in the book, um, they are listed in our archives as having acquired. This batch, quite interestingly, our friends at Vacheron Constantine sold some of these watches, fully labeled Audemars Piguet and branded Audemars Piguet. They were essentially, um, they work as a, uh, on our behalf as a retail agent for some of our watches. So in our archives, some of these watches that we're looking at right now were sold through Fashion Constantine, which is quite fascinating. This one over here, as you said, this is really the, this, this is by this point, reference numbers have been introduced. Watches have reference numbers associated with them. This is now officially referenced 5516, what we now refer to as the first series. And it's the world's first wristwatch with perpetual calendar with leap year indication on the dial. The tech had had 1526 by this point, as well by this point, 2438 uh, and 2497. Um, but those beautiful watches, all wonderful, they don't have the leap year on the dial. They, they calculate the leap year, but it has to be set up by the watchmaker during the service. And then if the watch is set up and it's kept running, your leap year, of course, will, uh, will, will, be will be reflected. So here, what's quite interesting is the watchmakers really recreated a pocket watch dial. They took it quite literally to, to show the four-year leap cycle down at six o'clock. And this is also engraved and enameled. That's not printed. So those 48 months were all done by hand, engraved, wow. and then filled with black enamel. This yeah, you know, you know, for vintage, in the vintage world, the discussion between what's printed and what's enameled is, it's, it's such a critical part of, of understanding the originality of watches, understanding why certain watches age better than others. Um, and then, of course, when we go back for restoration when needed, it's essential to know exactly what was done and what methods and what means. So there's a lot of forensic horology that's done to understand these types of pieces. I've been in conversations for literally for over two decades with people like Helmut Krott and Davide Parmigiani, big experts in the field about all of these subtleties between printing and between enameling and between understanding how these different aspects age over time. So those aspects that we're looking at there, for example, on the 48 month cycle, all of that is engraved and then filled with black enamel. Um, all of those details are, and that's part of the reason why these watches have aged beautifully. This is part of the reason why collectors uh, really, really look to them through a special lens. 
And it's also the case, it's, it was large for this time, it was 36 millimeters. It has that very bold stepped bezel and beautiful lugs. And this picture of this one, this watch doesn't showcase it uh, ideally, but if you pull up some others from the comps book, you'll again see that combination of the satin and mirror finishing. Um, right. And that's such a critical part of Audemars Piguet, past, present, and future, that combination of a mirror polish and a satin finish right next to each other. A lot of people are aware of that on the Royal Oak. The Royal Oak is a beautiful expression of that, the ultimate expression of that. But it's a design aesthetic that goes back to the 1910s at Audemars Piguet. Um, on pocket watches and wrist watches, the satin and mirror finishing being nestled right up next to each other. Are these watches also still using the same uh, Valjou um, base? Yeah, they are still using that Valjou 13 line movement blank. Why don't we go from there? So the other um, watch that was uh, very interesting was in 1957, you launched six watches. And these six watches had, well, I think of these six watches, five of them had like a leap, separate leap year indicator at 12 o'clock, right? And then one of them had like a leap year indicator that also followed the 48 month um, at, at 12 o'clock as well, right? So, but these are the first ones that actually had, had sort of separated out the leap year indication and the month indication. The idea with the second series of these watches, clearly the watchmakers at the time wanted the dial to breathe a little bit more. Um, right. There's a beauty to that highly complex first series with the moon phase up at 12. By the way, you, if you, if keen, uh, people who are really aware of our, Historic and our new watches noted on RD2, the moon phase was up at 12 o'clock, um, which was a, a little nod to that original 1955 um, perpetual calendar. Um, we hadn't had the moon phase at 12 o'clock in quite a long time, so um, we were excited to have it return to that place on, uh, on our most recent, one of our most recent perpetual calendars. And this is kind of a cool watch also because it's got a double signature. It's got a Tiffany & Co. double signature as well. But um, what uh, Michael is referring to, obviously, is that here now you have the months. Um, now it's just in sort of 12-month format at 3 o'clock. And then you've got a separate perpetual calendar leap year indication at, uh, at, at 12 o'clock. Moon phase has come down to, to 6. And then, of course, you've got the day of the week here at 9. And, of course, the date centrally um, off of the centrally mounted hand that is read off this perimeter. And let's, and we have to remember this had never been done before. So this, you know, we're looking to now this looks very sort of logical to us. It looks, our brains comprehend this right away, but these were first, these were taking the inherent complication and needing to express it in an aesthetic way. And they were experimenting. This, this, journey of experimentation is outlined in the complications book even in the very early era of wristwatches there's some illustrations we included from the watchmakers they weren't sure how the wristwatch was even going to be worn on the wrist they weren't sure what position would the crown be in what position would 12 o'clock be in so this notion of what we take for granted today everything even the positions of subsidiary dials all of this was happening for the first time that that recently in history uh, which is really interesting. Watches, this watches are babies. They're essentially 120 years old. Um, you know, there's there's some exceptions earlier on, bracelet watches, of course, but really, they're babies in that sense. We're in the infancy of wristwatches still. So, Michael, tell us a little bit about what's going on in this one. This is a second generation watch, from what I understand. This is where you, the moon phase drops down to the bottom, but it still retains that 48 month. So, this is just like that first generation except the, there's an inversion between the 48 months and the moon phase. But then We're, you have a month indicator at three o'clock as well for the- Exactly. Yeah, right. yeah, the month is indicated twice, twice. which is really, you, you have the short view and the long view. It's, it's really, it, as you said, it's this transitional model, this, this experimentation of dial layouts. It's really a, a fascinating window into how watches were produced at that time. They knew they had the complication, they knew what they wanted to express, but the, what we would now call the user interface, what would the UI look like? How would the person interact with the watch? Um, it's a really a fascinating window, one-to-one, -to, -one to see how they arrived at the version they did, um, which really then becomes the template for perpetual calendars up to this day. It's very much represented similarly to that version, that final version of the, of the second series. 
Uh, would it be fair to say that uh, of the second series watches that we've seen, that one that has the double month indication, both at, at 12 o'clock and at three o'clock, would be the, uh, one, one of the earlier ones, as you were mentioning, is kind of a transitional model? The first, the, the very first ones that of the, of with the leap year indication, the first three had the moon phase up at 12. And then, and then that one comes afterwards. I have to check the order of the serial numbers, but I'm pretty sure if we that look one. it up, that one was cased fourth of okay. those nine. Okay, yeah. so then let's look at the Gen 1, which has got the 48-month uh, leap year cycle at 6 o'clock. Yeah, exactly. And there, there's three of these as well. Exactly, right? exactly. The Gen so 1 that, that were called Reference 5516 um, in the material that had the designation of that reference number. Um, you have the moon phase up at 12 o'clock, and you have the 48 months at the 6. But again, there's variation between these three. There's they're not all identical one to the next. There's different dial finishes, different subtleties throughout the watches. If you look at the sub dial or the dial at six o'clock, there are two hands. There's a gold hand and a blue hand, right? So is the gold hand kind of doing the month within, and then the the blue hand kind of staying at the year cycle? The the blue hand is indicating the month, and the gold hand is indicating where we're at in the leap year cycle. Cool. Thank you very much. So you have the gold hand is there at, in the first year of the cycle, and the blue hand is there. You were in March in the third cycle, heading into the fourth. You can see that. Understood. Cool. Understood. So that's where you've got um, everything in blue, including day of the week, month, date, and then the month that you're in in the current cycle, correct? Correct. Okay, cool. So then let's look at Gen 2, but let's first look at that watch that's got the 48-month um, uh, calendar at, at 12 o'clock because that is kind of an oddball that's got month twice. Sure. But you know, this, this kind of stuff is so interesting. And to me, this watch is like just so fascinating because if it really represents that kind of transition between Gen 1 and Gen 2, it's, it's even more intriguing, you know? Absolutely. Those first two that we were looking at, the black and white photos, yeah. they appeared in the registers in 1948, but it's just the movement, okay? Because remember, movements would be made and then the watches would be cased up sometimes later. So now, let's start with the one with moon phase up at 12 o'clock. Both of these movements were entered into the registers in 1948. So work begins on the movement in 1948. In 1950, the one on, on the, the right of the screen with the moon phase at 12 o'clock, yeah. that watch was sold to Gubelin in 1950. Okay. Wow. Now, there's a note that there was an additional one that was sold to Patek Philippe, but not until 1962. Wow. So we believe that we don't know this for sure because we don't, um, the, 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 the photograph doesn't always pertain exactly to the specific watch in the archives. Most likely the watch on the left was the one that was sold to Patek because by then the moon phase was over at six o'clock. Wow. Okay. So that's what I was mentioning before. I think this one was sold later and that would make a lot of sense because that's why there's no leap year indicator on it, because it's the 1948 movement being cased 14 years later in 1962. Um, now, we don't know more behind what took place as to how Patek Philippe ordered, but we just know that they, they acquired the watch. But it's, of course, not the first time Patek Philippe acquired an Audemars Piguet watch by any means, but uh, that one it was quite interesting, because, of course, Patek were deep into their production of perpetual calendars by that point, we don't know for certain. Some of this, you know, some, some of historical work is, is detective work. You, you have things that you could confirm from first generation documents, which we're very clear on, and then there's things which we could only speculate. So what we wrote in the book was a subsequent note in the catalog indicates a second of these watches was sold in New York in 1962 to Patek for 1,600 USD, by the way. That's wow. a lot of money. That's a lot of dough in 1962. <laughs> Um, but these were, of course, as we discussed, individually made very, very special watches. So that's, there's the clarity now. I, I was pretty sure, but I wanted to have the data in front of me. Those of, you, those of you guys watching who know me know I would beat myself up if I were wrong on one of these points that I had. Uh, that's cool also because I think they launched the 3448 by 61, right? So that they don't, like, Paddock already had its own perpetual calendar. And the fact that someone from Paddock wanted to buy that one, it's, it's cool. 
Um, okay, so that, shall we take a look at then at the, uh, the, the, the first gen watch? Uh, with yes, the exactly. There you go. So now you're looking at one of the examples of three. And as we, and as we discussed, you have that transitional one as well, that sort of in-between version as well. With the 48 months we discussed, you have the 29 and a half lunar calendar up at the 12 o'clock position, which I mentioned we referenced recently on RD2, the ultra thin self-winding perpetual calendar royal oak. Um, and so you, you still have that month indicated twice here on these watches. Um, you have the four year view and then you have the 12 month view over there at one glance. It's really, at this time, the watches were referred to as astronomical wristwatches. Right. That was a historic term. And, you know, we forget all the time derives from astronomy. I mean, that's all that time is, is a mathematical model of our local astronomical happenings. And the perpetual calendar is the ultimate expression of that relationship of, of Earth to the moon and astronomy, local astronomy. So it was natural in that sense for the pocket watches to indicate that four-year cycle because you need the place where you are very, very clearly within that cycle to be accurate. Um, and I, I think it's really cool that they attempted it on these wristwatches and achieved it. I can only imagine the labor that was involved in creating those. When we show the dial makers today and the watchmakers today, these 5516s under a loop, they're just blown away. This is one of those techniques which people can attempt now, but you know this, you hear the discussion about um, 2526 dials. This is taking it to a whole nother level when you look at that degree of engraving and enameling. Very few people alive today are able to pull off a historically sensitive restoration of that type of dial work. Okay, so let's go from here to the first of the second generation 5516s, which has got that double month indication. It's got the 48-month uh, um, cycle at uh, 12 o'clock, and it's also got a month indication at 3 o'clock. So here we have uh, the um, first, I guess, one of the first watches in the second generation, uh, since it's right. got the 48-month cycle up at the top, but it's also got a month indication for clarity. I guess part of this is also like, uh, you know, when you kind of get to the age when you can own a perpetual calendar is precisely the time when you can't read it anymore. You know, it certainly is true in my, my case. Um, so, yeah, you'd have to have amazing eyesight to be able to read it just off that, that, that scale on the top. Absolutely. You'd have your little magnifying glass nearby to see what time it was. Um, exactly. But it's still absolutely stunning. So that's right. This one is just inverting the 12 and the 6 o'clock registers. That's it's essentially what it's doing. But it, it is a good indication. It's a great design lesson as to just you can look at them side by side and just the repositioning of a moon can just redefine the total design of the watch. The, and the sensitivity of balance on both watches is very interesting. When we look at contemporary watches today, and a very exciting thing about modern watchmaking is how adventurous we can be thanks to computers and CAD and CNC. But what happens sometimes is symmetry gets considered differently because we're able to play with asymmetry to such an extent. But we as biological entities are, are we were driven towards symmetry. For, a whole host of different evolutionary biological reasons. And for me, when I see a watch like this, whether the moon phase is a 12 or six is irrelevant, what I see is just a beautiful symmetrical dial. And I think that's something that contributes towards its long lasting effect that, uh, that it has. It's just, it's just pleasant, it's calming in that sense. It makes, there's a logic to it in that sense. Even with the complexity of the information at 12 o'clock, it still maintains a beautiful symmetry throughout. Amazing. Let's go from here to the watch that you just had up, which is the one, uh, the 5516 second generation watch with just the leap year indication on the top and then the month indication at three. I think the, the Tiffany double stamp watch. Retail exactly. by Tiffany, exactly. So yeah, this is, this is just, it cleans it up quite a bit. Um, and it's, 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 again, a really creative design as well when you look at the printing. Um, I should say the font, not the printing, because it's done in, engraved and enameled. And if you look at the pocket watches from this era, again, by Audemars Piguet, as well as our friends in the Valet, um, you're gonna see very similar aesthetics in terms of the fonts, in terms of the style. There are some collectors who like to have what they refer to as companion pieces. They'll have the wristwatch from the 50s and the pocket watch, which has almost those same aesthetics. Um, and you really get a feel for that relationship in the design between pocket and wristwatches. 
Pocket watch production had declined heavily by the 50s, but it was still there. It was still a, it was still very much part of what the companies were producing, um, and it was still the primary format in terms of production numbers of complications, um, as we can see by how few of these were made. But it does open it up a lot. It breathes a lot more. But I, I, I still have a personal preference for kind of the craziness of that first generation dial with all of those four. I love the fact that you have four years represented on a wristwatch on the previous version. Design wise, this is of course more balanced, but I, the technicality of the first version is just, it blows my mind. Are some of these watches in the museum collection? Absolutely. Many of these are in the museum collection. And uh, as you've seen some of the images of, of what's coming around the corner very, very soon, you'll, You'll notice when you visit the New Odomar Piguet Museum that it's not an overabundance of watches on exhibition. It breathes. There, you can pace and you can walk through, and there's a lot of historical and cultural context that's provided. As a, that's a choice that uh, that we made, and we decided as to how we wanted to present the story of the company. Um, and complicated wristwatches and pocket watches are, of course, very much a centerpiece, and many of the great pieces are on exhibition. Others we didn't want to have a permanent exhibition in the museum because it's really important to have watches for traveling exhibitions, um, small dinners. You know, you've been part of those where just having two or three vintage watches on a tray to be able yeah. to try them on and look at them and experience them, that's really special. So we wanted to make sure we had not just, um, I mean, great pieces for those experiences as well. Um, but yeah, these watches are going to be there on exhibition and it's going to be very much part of the tour and part of the experience. What the beautiful, one, one of my favorite things about the new museum is when you're, when you're in the, I'm not spoiling anything because it has been revealed in the media, but when you're there in the grand complication section of the museum and you're looking at these masterpieces, just two meters behind you are the several men and women producing our grand complications of today. And it's not a simulated workshop, it's the workshop. It is, it's, that's their ship. And that link, that thread between the watchmakers of the past and those today is something that was really at the heart of Remaster as well. That's something we really wanted to demonstrate was, was have, can, can we have people contribute towards a project across generations? And if you're just simply recreating a watch from the past, you're just, it's nothing wrong with that at all, but it's a certain process of recreating something. And, and that's its own study and it's its own course of action, which is a very noble and very interesting course of action. And when you're doing something that's entirely new and innovative, that's also extremely exciting with our concepts. I love working on those projects. But to work on a project that is consciously creating, passing the baton of, of the design of the past and updating it into a way uh, where the watchmakers could be part of it today was a really exciting project. And, and the meetings, extensive meetings, about the dial alone was incredible. But even down to how far the chronograph pushers protrude from the case. I mean, we had a meeting about that, looking at the original, looking at the remaster, adjusting it at the uh, micron level. It was just really, really fun to, to really nerd out to such an extent in such a different way on each aspect of the watch. Um, that was that was fun. And Francois knew from the beginning, and I agreed that, that uh, we wanted to have the most modern movement in there. We knew we wanted to really do a remix, uh, really, really do a nice blend of those aesthetics, but a modernized version. Let's talk a little bit about the fact that AP somehow, or Audemars Piguet, um, does some of its best work in the middle of a crisis, right? So you have the quartz crisis, you get the launch of the Seiko Accutron, the entire watch industry is being decimated. Um, and in 1972, the Royal, Royal Oak Offshore is born, which is probably the most counterintuitive watch you could possibly create at the time. Steel luxury watch that costs the same as a Jaguar. But, what, and, and, but that watch has become legend, but maybe the story that people don't know as much is in 1977, there's the creation of a movement, caliber 2120 slash 2800, which is mating the base caliber of the Royal Oak, the 2120, with a Dubois Dupraz uh, perpetual calendar module, which then goes into a watch called the 5548, which you guys go on to sell a crazy amount of, right? Yeah. So tell me about uh, that movement, why it was developed, uh, and then the 5548 also as a watch that somehow became one of your most popular models. 
many people will quote and state that the Royal Oak saved us from the Oaks crisis. And it's, the Royal Oak certainly helped, but it wasn't the Royal Oak that saved during the court's crisis. I would say the Royal Oak was maybe dodged us from the court's crisis. It was the bob and the weave, but what really, what really hits the home run, really knocks out um, AP and sets us up is the project you're referring to, the 2120 QP, wow. which, which was from a commercial standpoint, from a profitability standpoint, it's nothing less at Audemars Piguet than the rebirth of complications at AP. Wow. Our friends at Patek had continued to make complications, okay? We had taken a break. We had had a period in the 60s where we were focusing on beautiful dress watches, design watches, form watches, shape watches, and there were not many complications that were being uh, sold. There were some, but there were not many. So this period in the 70s is very much the rebirth of complications. It's the reaction to the court's era, the court's crisis. It was the acknowledgement at Audemars Piguet, and again, we weren't alone by any means. There were others in, in this dialogue, but it was the acknowledgement that there's still a market for high-end, hand-finished, beautifully crafted, complicated mechanisms. And the design of this watch was ultimately done not by Genta, but by his successor, the wonderful Jacqueline Dimier, who is just so central to Audemars Piguet. It's just, she's just amazing. She, of course, worked with Genta directly. She feminized the Royal Oak in 76. In 70, same years, and well, released in 77, she was the one behind the white gold Royal Oak 5402, the yellow gold 5402, the two-tone. <laughs> and then boom, oh, look at that. You have, well, that's, I didn't see what you had on, nice. I had a, a yellow gold 5402. Wonderful, wow, that's a beauty, man. Look at that. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, we were, we're working on something. It's, gonna, it's still a little while away, but we're working on, uh, on, on some definitive information about the Royal Oak 5402. So sit wow, tight. Amazing. It's going to take some time, but, but we're diving deep on every shred of information, all first generation documents, the real story, the real facts about that watch. How did the relationship between you and Roger Pros and AP come about such that, um, because I think that you were the, pr the primary um, amazon that was using this complication throughout through the, the next couple of decades, right? We've always enjoyed working with, with partners and suppliers that are also independent, that also have that, that family energy, that also sort of have that, 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 the same sort of values that we look to. That's very important at the board level that the relationships that we engage in share those same types of principles and same types of values. And Dupois Dupras has just been just a wonderful partnership for Audemars Piguet over the decades. There has been a consistency, a reliability, a workflow. Um, there's just been so, it's, it's been very beneficial in both regards. And we have to remember, historically, Audemars Piguet and the other big houses of the region, Vacheron Patek, historically, these companies were a table de we, They were finishers. They were taking the industrial components and the industrial movements, as mentioned, Gégé Le Côte at the time of Le Côte, or Valjou, or Le Magne, some of these incredible the engine behind the swiss watch industry you you have nothing without these this, yes. these are the foundations this is what this is but this is also that semi-industrialization that it never went full force in this region like it did in the u.s the uk and other parts of switzerland it was always this balance between okay the machine is going to make this component but only up to the point all the finishing all the decoration all the complications boom that's going to come after this tension between industry and hand finishing and hand work has always been at the center of the dialogue at Audemars Piguet from the very, very beginning. Um, and this question is always being asked. I mean, this is why, this is why we, we show behind the curtain when you come to the factory, we're, we're, we have no problem talking about computers and machine finishing because we still do so much by hand and that balance is so well maintained. Um, you know, that's something that, that the board, Francois, fought very hard for over the last two decades is, is preserving the bench and preserving the role of the, the human hands as much as possible. Most interestingly, going back to the 1930s story has been the revitalization of open working. I mean, 
you know, you, way you remember 10 years ago, skeletonized watches, they were cool, but they weren't like, uh, the, the people didn't have a fever over them. No. And, and now it's so exciting. So many brands are doing wonderfully well. And I love it because it really puts the attention back on the, the craftspeople, back on the men and women uh, creating, creating those pieces. You know, probably even more so after this period where people are going to be kind of longing for human contact. And if you can't have it like person to person, to see the, the hand of the artisan in your watch somehow will be that much more emotionally evocative. But, but let's go to uh, the 5548 because you yeah. guys, you know, this becomes a massive hit for you. Yep. Um, That's one of the first ones, exactly. And interestingly enough, here, we, here the inventors of the wristwatch with leap year indication make the design choice to drop the leap year <laughs> when we issue this watch. So it was, de it was just determined at the time that it was, it was clean, the consumer wouldn't be interested in that technical detail. And at this point, Patek had also still not introduced the leap year indicator. That comes a few years later with reference 3450. Yeah, 1981. So, exactly. So this is, comes out in 78. Now, you have to remember, this is something that a lot of people don't realize. Before 1980, only two companies are producing perpetual wristwatches and series. Yeah. Companies have one-offs here and there. It's just Audemars Piguet and Patek Philippe. Absolutely. Patek's watch at this time, their automatic perpetual was referenced 3448, which is an amazing, beautifully collectible watch, but it's quite thick. It's a quite thick watch. What made this watch such a commercial success was that it was extra thin and it was extra thin by design. The movement of this watch is only 3.95 millimeters. That's incredible. Um, and the thickness of the whole watch is seven millimeters to 7.8, depending on which version. But um, that, that like any guy that loves wristwatches, that loves perpetual calendars, you need to go buy one of these right now. And I mean right now, because if you look at the prices of like, okay, I'll give you an example. We'll, we'll get to that watch later, but if 50, like 55, 54s, they're too expensive. Like they're, I can't afford them anymore. These you can still get for not crazy money. Okay, so I want to talk to you a little bit about this. First of all, are there multiple generations? Second of all, I have the figure of 2,187 pieces total with a peak in 1984 of 675 watches produced in that year. That Isn't that crazy? 1984, almost 700 perpetuals. It's, yeah, it's, it's a real reminder as to, as to you know, how, how strong the, in, the industry was even coming out of the crisis for some brands. Certain brands grew during the quartz crisis in significant ways. Um, and, you know, Audemars, Patek, Rolex, these were companies that, actually got stronger between 1970 and 1985 for different reasons. Incredible. We, um, you know, we tend to look at that story as just being one of decline, but there's more to it than that. This watch, so this becomes one of Jacqueline Dimier's playgrounds. And wow. the diversity of form language and design language in this model and this, that this reference went to is sensational. It's of course the same um, movement that goes inside the Royal Oak in 1984, but that means there's six years, five and a half years of this watch in, in the round form um, before it enters the Royal Oak. Okay, and, and I love the fact that it became the playground. So also the inside scoop that uh, Francois just gave us also was there was a lot of yellow gold, a lot of platinum, but rose gold was a little bit more rare. Is, is that? Is oh that yeah, rose gold. Rose gold was much more rare. If you look at the production numbers, they're in the book. You're going to see with some of these models. The first, you're going to bug out on this. The first generation, okay, the one that was made in 2,183 examples between okay. 78 and 84, okay. 2,066 are in yellow. Okay. What? 80. Yeah. 80 white gold. 32 are in platinum, four in steel, one in pink gold. What, dude? Yes. Okay, so, so uh, in order of rarity, it's, it's, it's pink gold, steel, if you can get one, and then, yep. and, then uh, and then I guess it's-, it's Platinum, uh, white gold, yellow gold. Dude. So it's quite interesting. And, um, and that's of that first generation. Now there's of course other models and things like this. So it really does speak, speak to it. What's interesting though is what, from 1984 afterwards, this movement, then two things happen. You have the second wave and you yeah. have it go into the Royal Oak. And so this is when we, 
but actually hang on do you, do you let me let me do a screen share right real quick yeah because i want to show you this crazy looking uh this one. Oh yeah <laughs> i love that somehow oh yeah if you look in the back of the comps book you're going to see a whole bunch of them indicated yeah this is just wild isn't it i mean so cool <laughs> it's been by the way the person who owned this watch loved it they wore the hell out of that piece look at that look at the dial on there Maybe we can go to, the year is 1984 or 83, uh, it's 83, with the, and the launch is of the 5554, which is the Royal Oak um, Perpetual Yeah, Valley. 84 is when it's officially out, and, and there you go. go. Still, still no awakening, so 84 is when it's officially out, and still yeah. no leap year indicator for the first gen. I think it's not Correct. So the, 93. 93. 93, okay. 93 is when you see the leap year come in, so collector tip, if you have or see on the market one of these earlier ones with a very low like C number or D number and it has the modern font and the leap year indicator, you, you can be certain that there's been a modification and a dial change. Okay. You want to see that and, and the very first version has that sans serif font, that block font, yes. um, like the original Royal Oak. It changes okay. soon. Um, but the very, very first ones, this is precisely what you're looking for, what you have up here on the screen. Okay, so we're looking for exactly this sans serif font, font. Um, no tapestry at the time, is it correct? That's right, and a, lot, and a lot of people were curious why on the per commercial available version of RD2, was there no tapestry? There's a little, a little historic connection. So, okay. uh, you know, those are two little nods to RD2 from the past, right? The, the moon phase up at 12, like the 1955, sans tapisserie. We don't, you know, it wasn't like this conscious choice of, um, of, of let's figure out ways to get history into the watch. It was right. things that we arrived at through looking at different interpretations and what breathed and what worked for the watch. But both of those, which were people were curious about upon release, and a lot of people didn't know that there was a historic precedent at AP that the Royal of Perpetual was not born with the history dial. We didn't, we wanted the first commercial RD2, uh, the 26586 IP to also reflect that, that lovely satin finish. I, I was looking at these watches four or five years ago and they were like 30 grand. Now if you want one, they're like a hundred grand. You know, it's, yeah. it's like, it goes to show you how crazy the prices went in like four or five years. And I think part of that was the success of, you know, the RD2 and the Algorithm Perpetual Calendar. Part of it's also that, you know, like, the, you know, the people started to talk about them a lot more. Well, you also had about five, six years ago, the conscious choice of various dealers and collectors worldwide who just decided to collect them yes. because there, it was an opportunity watch. It was something with, that packed a lot of substance but was still relatively affordable, like you just mentioned on the 5548s. That is an amazing, like, I'm telling you right now, that is, that is like an amazing value right now. Like you can buy a really nice example for like 10 grand, you know? Absolutely, I mean, you can buy the yellow gold standard example, 10 to 12,000. Keep in mind, guys, if you're looking, and, and women, if you're looking to buy one, of course, getting the watch like that serviced, is gonna take a little bit of time and, and money as well. There's a little more investment when you're buying an older watch than just the purchase price. But it's definitely a buyer's market watch. And at the same time, you know, there's no secrets. If you're lucky enough to see a platinum one of those, you're getting one of 32 watches made. Sure. Um, and just to give you some, also some data on that first Royal Oak that you had up, most of those were yellow gold. So the first okay. gen Royal Oak, uh, perpetual calendar, 229 yellow gold. And again, I'm looking at my uh, data here, 49 steel and only one platinum. There's a Gen 1 Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar and platinum. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay, so when he's first to Gen 1, he's talking about 1984 to 1992 or 93? Three, three is, when the, is when the leap year indication returns on the watches. And then 93 to uh, 2015, we're basically using the same movement, 2120 and this is yep. with the reintroduction of the leap year indication, which uh, at the moment actually now are actually going for more money than the first gen ones. So that's sure. also a, a really a, like an inside thing as well. Um, and now Michael's just told you the absolute numbers they were made in. So now you know, right? So let's look at one crazy ass version of that, which is Rose Gold and Tantalum. Which is well, this is it. I mean, you set me up right there, man. Gen 2, this era of Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar is just as wild 
as you can imagine, with case materials, combinations, finishing, open working, this stuff was, it was really ahead of its time. So and I mean, yeah, look at that thing. So cool, dude. Skeleton, uh, like tantalum, rose gold bezel, a lynx and crown. I, it's just so badass, dude. I just, I love it. Imagine in a hundred years, you show that object to a student of, of history and you say, when is this made? It's, they're, they're going to have a hard time pinpointing it. It's a really, it's a really strange and beautiful and curious object. The finishing of the metal, that gun metal tone combined with the rose gold. It's, it's a really, it's, it's really special, this watch. I, I, these combos are just unlike anything else. And it also speaks, you know, Audemars Piguet's adventurousness or unconventionality, it's there every single decade. Really, it's ultra clear beginning in the 1910s, ultra clear. But to see it expressed differently decade to decade is what's fascinating. And here you can see in the 1990s, this is a very good depiction that AP was hand finishing beyond, really beyond just about anyone in the industry um, not everyone, but really at the highest level, but with real adventurous designs, very on the pulse of different, experimental, curious. You know, this is a different era of watchmaking than today. This is before Richard Mille and Grubel Force. Well, Stephen was at AP at the time, by the way, you yeah. know, um, or at APRP, rather, at the time. This, but this is before the type of, of the 20th, first century watchmaking we, we were so familiar with today. These are the types of watches that help set up that post-2000 era, which I really think the concept is the start of, of, of a lot of that. That's such a dope watch, man. The, uh, man it's okay, crazy. So let's talk about this watch uh, for a second. Can I ask you, the sapphire dial watches, the ones that are transparent where you can see the level of work, are those specifically Gen 2 watches? Are Gen 1 watches all solid dial watches? Um, no. Um, in fact, there is, if you look in, the, in your comms book, at page 232 and page 233, you're gonna see some of the Gen 1 perpetual calendars in the round form or octagonal, round octagonal, I'm not, it's not a, a Royal Oak. Um, these were Jacqueline Demier designs and these have also open work with sapphire crystals. Wow. And these are, these are mid 80s uh, watches, mid 80s to late 80s. I mean, I'm looking at one that's a C series, so that's quite early. And um, it's, are they 5548s or are they? Yeah, exactly. I'm back into that, into the family of one. It was a reference 5564 that I'm looking at, um, which is, it's, it's that round one with that sort of beaded bezel that has those, okay. and it's open work with sapphire crystal and blue details. It's beautiful. So no, we had that aesthetic earlier. Um, in terms of Royal Oak, though, we did as well before 93. I'm looking at them now. Absolutely. We did have Gen 1 Royal Oak skeleton sapphire crystals. Very cool. The That's reference, cool. if you're curious, if you really want to nerd out, it's 25636BA. So that would be a yellow gold watch. So that's a pre-93 Royal Oak open work perpetual. And that, you know, the badassness about that watch is that even though there's no leap year indicator on it, you can still tell the leap year because you can see the cam underneath it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's cool. Okay, so uh, then let's go from there to 2015 with the launch of Caliber 55134. And I guess a nice example of a watch having that movement would be the ceramic perpetual calendar. When you have X number of perpetuals to make and you have steel and you have gold, and you have this color ceramic and the white ceramic and the open work versions, the pie gets cut very, very fast, which is even why the, why like the steel blue dial perpetual is also a very, uh, very hard watch to find. It's not a choice to make it difficult or problematic, but you already have a fixed number that we're at capacity at divided by several references. None of them can get made in large numbers, but, but, but back to the movement, um, that movement, the 5134, is an evolution of the 2120 QP. It's built off of the exact same caliber. It's, it's, um, it's very, very much utilizes the, the latest descendant of that 2120. By the way, we talk about a movement that gives so much life. You know, the, the first version of the 2120 time only goes back to 1967. Here we are in 2020 still utilizing uh, aspects of that watch, which is just amazing. 
Amazing. Okay, and then let's go from there to uh, 2018, the RD2. And, and I love that we were talking about how when you guys created this watch that you used uh, a dial with, without the tapestry because this is a nod to the original watch uh, from 1984, you know? Yep, and, absolutely. It's a very, it's, when you go through the museum and you look at the objects, you start to realize, hey, wait a minute, we take this for granted, but this is the actual story. This is the truth. This is, right. this is the origin point. Um, that's something we are all, that's the beauty of being in a family run business and an independent company is we can rely on first generation documents for all of our choices. We don't have to guess and we don't have to speculate. We, we try to really, everything we communicate on about the company, there needs to be that first gen document. There needs to be that source material. Now more than ever, this is the era of authenticity that we're in now. And this is only going to get more and more focused, a focal point. I think that a strong brand in any field and in any discipline, it's really about being direct, being honest, being clear, and, and showing what's behind the curtains, and not only showing it, demonstrating it, and sharing it. I think this is more and more what people are looking for, which is why, like in the comps book way, you could see or how open we are about who provides the EBOSH, LeCult, the importance of LeCult to AP, the importance of Vacheron, of Patek, in the Valley des Jus along with us. It's, um, you know, for us, this is the real story. This is the truth. This are the, these are the facts. And, uh, and it's a really beautiful story. And, 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 and many of us wish the industry could communicate with each other the way that we used to communicate with each other. Um, and certainly on individual levels, we do the best we can. But I think the industry is at its strongest when, when respect and, uh, is 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 really clear and people are, are cognizant of the great work that different brands and different watchmakers are up to um, it's a cool time right now so can you uh, put up the 2009 uh, production version of the elfrithian perpetual calendar please yeah you had the prototype up there which is now in the museum so you can visit the prototype and, and, and forgive me because the, the prototype had tapestry but the production watch had has no tapestry which i think is kind of cool because it kind of first of all is a nod back to 84 but also just helps to distinguish that um, that watch a little bit because it's so thin you know that kind of just that plain beautiful dial um just adds to the elegance of the watch right with this one with the additional complexity of the of the day night indicator you know the little drop dials it yeah. really made sense because those drop dials were competing with the squares of the tapestry it was too it was too much going on there and then once those versions came back with the satin dial it just it just sung to us we understood people's desire for a tapisserie when the point is made i i, I feel you you know I, I i think that's a valid point as well but the cleanliness of this watch and of course this is more of a of a post-production rendered watch we're looking at here an official one but if we're looking at the watch on the wrist it really has a nice shine to it as well and Michael, would you mind holding up the book uh, that we're getting all this information from? Oh, yeah, sure. This is books over here. I don't know if you can see it well. This is the story of Audemars Piguet's complicated wristwatches. It's, it's, it's filled a with... A oh, thanks. Yeah. We, the Heritage team, we spent seven, five, about five years working on this. Um, Sebastian Vivas, the director, and I took on the majority of the text, but the whole team worked on the study. Um, the research, Rafael Balestra, our archivist, Francisco Passenden, um, and uh, the late, great Angelo Manzoni, our watchmakers, were super critical to, to this book as well. And what we wanted to do, you'll see the book, it's broken down into chapters of chronographs, repeaters, and, and uh, calendar watches, chronos, calendars, and repeaters. And there's historical context, there's charts, there's data, and all 550 watches are referred to. Many of them are photographed, of course, not known that we're near all of them, but all 550 are referred to, and it gives a real good picture of how Audemars Piguet arrived where we have today. A lot of people know the second half of our story from 1972, the 86 Turbion, the 93 Offshore, the O2 Concept, boom. That's all super important, but all of those things were built upon accomplishments from 1875 through the 1950s. And that's what this book is shining a light on. It's reminding people of, of a little bit of that earlier story. 
Thank you so much for your time, Mark. Uh, I know you're there as well, so thank you guys. It's been so enlightening. Um, it's gonna make me want to go and like research all of this stuff. Now I'm kind of got like a, a, a yearning to go and track down also a first gen uh, Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar with a uh, with a, with a, a sapphire dial. That would yeah, be yeah. That's a tough find. That's a tough find. That's exactly. Crazy. But thank you so much for everything, brother. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Be well. Take care. Speak soon. Uh -huh.